so my talk is going to be about a programming language called BrainFAQ, uh, which is a really interesting esoteric programming language, you'll understand soon. But more importantly, we're going to live code a BrainFAQ interpreter together. And we're going to see how simple it is to write a virtual machine to run a programming language. So uh, th that's something that I remember thinking is extremely complex and I can't do that no matter what, it's just above my head. And then I tried one day and figured out it was like 15 minutes of work. So I want to show you how you can do it in 15 minutes. Um, so who knows this guy? Who is this? Alan Turing, excellent. And uh, what did he do? He did this, right? He created the Turing machine, which is a model of computation. Not a very good one, but it happened to be the first one published. And this model of computation apparently is mathematically equivalent to almost any other conceivable model of computation. So anything you can do with this thing, you can do with a CPU. And anything you can do with a CPU, you can do with this thing. And the same goes for lambda calculus and all other weird machines that compute stuff. They all have exactly the same amount of power. And um, so somebody asked the question, what's the minimal model of computation I can design that has the full power of Turing machines and can compute anything? And um, one of the answers they got was something called BrainFAQ. Um, it's a programming language. It has eight instructions, plus, minus, less than, greater than, um, brackets, and uh, dot and comma. Those increase and decrease. You have a, a buffer of bytes, like a long cyclic buffer of variables that can contain between 0 and 255. And uh, you have one pointer that points to one of those bytes. And you have plus and minus, which increase and decrease the value pointed to by the pointer right now. You have the other commands that forward, that move the cursor forward and back. You have something that works like a while loop, basically, when you encounter a uh, left bracket. If the current value is zero, you jump to after the right bracket. Otherwise, you continue going. When you encounter a right bracket, you jump back to the left bracket. And um, you can put brackets inside brackets, and it does the right thing. And you have um, dot for output and comma for input. And this is the entire programming language. And with this, people built, like, I don't know, uh, as, um, a DVD um, encryption decoder and uh, all, all other pieces, pieces of real software that does real things because this is equivalent to Python. It's equivalent to C in terms of what it can compute, not in terms of what kinds of input-output it can do, but in terms of what kind of code it can run. And uh, let's see a few examples. So uh, this code puts 15 in the current cell in the array. Let's see how it works. We have this uh, long array, and we have a pointer pointing to the leftmost cell. Do you all see? So let's move right, and then increase five times. So we have five. And now we start a loop. It's more than zero, right? Five is more than zero, so we keep going. We decrease once, go left, increase five three times, and now we go back to the last brackets, right? So again, four is more than zero, decrease once, go left, increase three times, go back right, jump back. Next time, it's going to be nine and two, right? Still more than zero, next time, one and 12, more than zero, 0 and 15, and this time it's 0, so it just goes to end of file and the code finishes running. Quite easy, right? Everyone could have written this code. Very simple, and it does something extremely important. It assigns 15 to, a, to an array cell. Um, let's look at some more interesting code. Anyone can guess what this does? So uh, let's run it. We'll skip a bit. Um, after running this loop many times, you see there's a big loop here. So after running it uh, 10 times, because this is 10 pluses, 
we'll have 70 in this cell, 100 in this cell, 30 in this cell, and 10 in this cell. You see, we go here and add 7, go one more right and add 10, and so on. So 70, 100, and etc. And then we go one to the right, add 2, and output a capital H. Go another one to the right, add 1, and output a capital E. You can all guess where this goes from here. Right, skip a bit. This is Hello World, not very optimized, but this is a reasonable Hello World in, in BrainFuck. And um, let's look at a more interesting piece of code. This is a universal Turing machine. This accepts a program and runs it. <laughs> um, we're not going to execute it and see it, how it works, but there's a link here that explains why this works and how it works. You're welcome to read it later. Um, I want to tell you about a, a specific project I did with BrainFuck when I was younger. Everyone here knows the idea of literate programming. I'm sorry, I can't see you. This light is so strong. I only see black faces, so <laughs> I have no idea if I lost you. Um, literate programming is this idea of uh, let's write a book or blog post and the code will be part of it, but documentation will be, w will be the main part. Like code will be the, um, the, the second class citizen. Um, and still that's the way we write a running program. We write a program as an explanation of what this program does. And uh, I did something a bit different. I wrote a little BrainFuck. Oh, by the way, anything other than those eight characters in BrainFuck is a comment. So you can add spaces, you can add English characters, whatever, just freely. As long as you don't use dots or pluses and minus signs and so on. Uh, let's zoom and enhance a bit. So uh, this is a cover letter I wrote for the army when I uh, wanted to get recruited to an interesting technological unit. And uh, you have like a few pluses there and then the date and my address and uh, I'm writing to you in search of a challenging position, comma, involving software development and cryptology, left bracket, when I decided to leave Atuda, blah, 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 blah. Here's a piece of code that happens to be encoded in this. This is the piece of code over here plus comments. And this is the second part. Not very interesting, you can see some nice formatting tricks. Uh, show plus your skills, don't discuss minus them, all kinds of smart assing around to be able to encode this program as a, as a cover letter for my CV. And uh, here's the code. Can anyone tell me what this code does? And now when you see some output, so we give this code the word hello and it outputs this. And let's pipe that back into BrainFuck. So this code accepts ASCII input and outputs a BrainFuck program that outputs the same input. Um, I didn't write it, I modified it a bit to, to better fit the, the formatting of my letter without changing, without changing uh, meaning, but basically I, got, I searched the internet for interesting short BrainFuck programs. This is very short and yet it was very hard to encode just this into a one page letter. And, um, and it's a pretty cute program. So um, let's do the interesting part of the talk now. How much time do I have left? Yes, we're on time. The real reason I wanted to do this was not that I think BrainFuck is that interesting. The real reason I wanted to do this was that I wanted to show you how easy it is to implement a, a virtual machine. Python, by the way, has a virtual machine that runs Python bytecode. And uh, Java has a virtual machine that runs Java bytecode. It's called JVM. And these pieces of software are very complicated, very optimized, but at their root, it's a very simple piece of code. And since BrainFuck is such a simple programming language, implementing a, a virtual machine for like implementing an interpreter for it is more like implementing a virtual machine than a programming language compiler. So let's have a look and try to do it. Um, we'll need a text editor. We'll need a speaker, uh, like a microphone that works. Wait, you can't hear me now. Um, how about now? Yeah, this seems to work. 
and we'll need somewhere to run our code. So uh, first, let's run this empty file. It does nothing. Perfect. Now let's think about our code for a moment. We'll have this function brainfac. Wait, not Facebook, brainfac. And it accepts some code. And it uh, does some stuff, probably returns some output. So we can write some tests for it. For example, on an empty input, it should do nothing, right? And uh, let's try to think of, a, of an interesting BrainFact program that uses very few commands. So maybe one, two, three, four, five, ten. This would output a new line. And um, maybe another test, 13. And uh, wait, we need to actually output. And let's output a Windows new line. And uh, after that, maybe we'll want to implement something that uses some more commands. So uh, let's do loops. Let's mm, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What's the ASCII number for, uh, for capital A? Anyone knows? 65, which is 64 plus 1. So 8 times 8 plus 1. Uh, of course, we'll need to do this. And then move 1 left, because the loop finishes when the counter is 0, not when the output is 0. And then add 1 and output that. And this should output capital A. And let's next do something that also gives a, that also uses input. So maybe um, we'll have this loop that runs three times, and it uh, accepts a character of input and outputs that. And uh, we'll need like an optional parameter for our program for our. Uh, function that allows us to give input. So uh, let's give some input. And this should only output the first three characters, because it only runs three times. And eventually, we'll want to do something that could run forever and only halts based on how much input we have. So uh, same thing, only with an infinite loop, right? We increment this to 1, and then we never touch cell zero of the array, so the loop stays, keeps running forever until we're out of input, and this should output A, B, C, D, E. And last but not least, let's do an interesting example. So we'll go here and uh, go a few places back and uh, use this. So if we run the result of running this on hello world, It should output hello world, right? So is this a good implementation plan? We know more or less the order in which we want to implement features of our code. I'll just say that when we're done with this, we'll try to do like a, a version that can run live and not accept input as a parameter, do the stuff, and, and only output when it halts. So uh, let's try writing some code. First of all, we'll need memory. We say that our memory is like a circular array. Usually, like the standard is 40,000 characters, so let's do that. And we'll need an instruction pointer, which is where we are in our code. And we start at 0, and we'll need like a cursor, which is where we are in memory. And we'll start it at 0. And. Yeah, that's about it, I think. So um, while true, or maybe actually while instruction pointer is less than the length of code, do some stuff, like increment the instruction pointer. Right, this is the basic structure. You read a command, you perform it. So here we just need to perform the commands. After you finish performing it, move on to the next command, do the same thing again. And what's performing the command is just reading it. So uh, instruction is code at instruction pointer. And then there's like a switch statement. If instruction is 
uh, plus will want to say memory at the current position of the cursor plus equals one. Only these are bytes and Python integers are not bytes. So uh, instead we'll do like uh, its current value plus one modulo 255. Very simple, right? Any questions? Otherwise, maybe it's dot. And if it's dot, we'll want to like uh, std out dot write the character value of, of memory at cursor. Is this right? Any questions? We'll need to import sys for this to work. And let's run this. Um, does not output slash n. This is not good, why not? Because maybe we should, wait, maybe instead of this we should like keep the output and return that. So uh, output will be an empty, and here we'll have output dot append and here at the end we'll have like join this into, these are Python idioms, right? Everyone knows uh, nothing.join. And first test passed, yeah! Second test passed actually, the first test was the empty one. Two tests passed already. <laughs> now let's make the third test passed, pass. We'll only need to implement minus I think. So if it's minus, same thing except minus one. Bigger, you mean? Light, oh, the right side, you can't see the right side. Um, I've never tried this, so bear with me for a moment. And uh, I think we're better than on time, but... Excellent. Cool. So, uh, yeah, third test passed. Now we're on to the hard stuff. We need to implement brackets. Brackets are, in, uh, brackets are complicated. So let's do brackets. If instruction is left bracket. What do we need to do here? We need to like change instruction pointer um, to be like, first of all, there's an if here. If uh, memory at cursor is zero, because otherwise we just don't do anything, right? We let it go and at the end we'll jump back here. Now we could do something here about saving our current position and then when we get to the closing bracket we'll uh, know we saved it so we'll go back here. But it's kind of complicated. Why don't we just parse our code once and create like a simple dictionary of where we need to jump? So let's call that like uh, matched parents at this position and we'll, uh, and we'll implement that in a moment. So uh, that would be like a preliminary stage. Matched parents is uh, parse parents of code. And uh, so how does this function work? Parse parents, it gets code and returns like a dictionary and uh, let's write some tests to figure out what we want to do. So probably for empty, simplest case first, we'll get an empty dictionary for uh, maybe the simplest possible case where it does something, it's like what, zero goes to one, one goes to zero, right? And maybe one thing we can do is uh, add something here to complicate it, and then it's zero goes to two, two goes to zero. And the only more interesting case is probably when we have nested brackets. So uh, zero goes to zero, one, two, three, four. Four goes to zero. And also two goes to three, and three goes to two. Am I right? I think I'm right. The test will fail if I'm wrong, so that's fine. Um, let's initialize our uh, our empty dictionary, and then we just need to go over the code and do this parsing. So for every character in code, actually I'll probably want the index too, so let's enumerate code. And uh, 
Yeah, so if the character is an opening bracket, we'll want to save it in a stack, right? Because when you have uh, nested things, you want a stack to save them. So let's have a stack. And we can push this to a stack. So stack.append the position of this. Else, if it's a closing bracket, um, let's pop the stack. And this is the innermost, um, innermost opening parent right now. So let's call it uh, match. And um, so result at i is match. And result at match is i. And this should basically be it. So running this. Yeah, the tests for parse parents succeeded. We only failed here because this, the closing parent still counts as a comment. So let's just implement closing parent. Elif instruction is closing parent. We'll just need to jump back. So uh, instruction pointer is matched parents at instruction pointer. And this should work. Whoa, infinite loop. Um, probably an infinite loop in the test. Can any? Hmm? I didn't feel this. I think I did. Yeah, I did. Let's just like print something here. Uh, for example, let's print the instruction pointer and like the first 10 memory cells. Whoa. Okay, so what happens? 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, 17, 20. Goes back to 9, 10. Um, so you're saying I did this the, like the opposite way. At the, wait, okay, so, yeah, I need to continue here, exactly. Right, so what happened was when I got to the end, I jumped back to the beginning, and then, and then, uh, and then added one, and I should have, shouldn't have added that one, nope. That I needed to do this continue, but that wasn't the bug we're talking about. Uh, I think this is, this is reversed or something. Uh, let's see. Or maybe we just have a bug in the test. So what do we have here? Eight times, go here, do this. You yeah, know, this looks good. Mm. This is your time to shine, everyone. Help me debug my code. Yeah, this plus one like happens after this. And maybe it shouldn't? The what? The angles, right, we didn't implement the angles. That's pretty important actually. <laughs> Let's implement the angles. The danger with like having other things be comments, by the way, let's like uh, document this. The danger of everything else being a comment is that you forget things like this. So going back means instruction pointer. Uh, no, cursor. Cursor is like it's uh, value minus one, only modulated to size of memory because uh, it's a circular array, as we said. And here the same goes with plus. And this looks pretty good. We can remove our print, or maybe just comment it out because we'll probably need it later. So uh, yeah, next test. And this test needs input. So uh, input. And maybe let's have an uh, input index. And it starts at 0. 
And for the input instruction, which is comma, we'll need to like uh, memory at cursor is the number numeric value of input at input index and input index grows by one. Um, but we probably need, yeah, to default with an empty input. So memory at cursor. Right, what happens if, if uh, we go above the end? They go after the end. So here, if input index is more or equal to than length of uh, input, then let's just quit right here because Hmm? Break, right, break. Thanks. And all our tests pass. Woo! So, so this is all there is to it, right? This is a programming language. You, we've just implemented it. Any one of you, even the most beginners here, could have done it at home. What you had here was a few lists, a few dictionaries like a few plus ones and minus ones, the most complex Python feature we've used is the modulo operation, which is like the fifth exercise in, uh, in uh, like uh, semester one of computer science. So any non-computer scientists here, sorry. Um, let's do one more thing. Let's try to like make it a, a real like uh, program that works. So we still need the, the tests. But we also want this to work based on keyboard input and uh, output to the screen. So we'll need a way to pass in code. Let's use command line arguments for that. And we'll need a way to pass in input. Let's use std in and output. Let's use std out. And I don't want to refactor it too, uh, too strongly because I want these tests to still exist. So what we'll do is we'll keep this function but we'll have another function that does the, the real work. Let's call it brainfuck. And this function will just um, call the other one. And uh, somehow return output. So uh, this line will probably be here because the whole fake output thing and fake input thing are features of of this and not of the real brain fuck, uh, function. So uh, we can do this and now this function will need like a, a way to mock input or you, uh, output right now. So let's give it a, a function called putchar whose default will be sys std out right. A tab? I'm sorry, where? Probably not. Here. The screen is cut? Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> this is terrible. OK. <laughs> yeah, now you can see the code running. Uh, sorry, that was insane. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we have this function, which is like a wrapper that mocks input and output, and we have this function, which has a default right and also has like the fake right. And here in the output, instead of this, we'll have like um, put char, the, the mocking, uh, how do you call it, hook. And now we need to just pass like put char is put and let's define some put so put will be something that gets a char and uh, output dot append the char right len input um, this is good I think because the first time this happens is like in the first test that has input which means this passed and we're good to go and uh, now let's just do the same thing for input. So um, we'll need to have a get char, which by default is sys std in dot read one. But wait a moment, this is a call to a function. So uh, 
Let's make it a function with no, with no arguments, right? And we'll need to pass a, a mocked get char here. So get char is get. And how do we implement this get? We, we, have, the, we have the input, which is a string here. And uh, we need a function that accepts nothing and returns like uh, input at i, where i is something, let's say a global. This will not work, but uh, we'll see why in a moment. And yeah, we need to uh, like say char is uh, input i, i is increased, and uh, return char. Only this doesn't work because i here is local, and uh, i here is outside. And we can't do global i because, um, because this is not global, it's just non-local, it's in the scope above. In Python 3, we have this keyboard, keyword non-local, which does this. But we're not in Python 3, so instead we'll do this. We'll say get.i is zero, and here get.i plus equals one, and get.i, input at get.y. And this works input length. Um, yeah, so we'll need to do something instead of just checking for input length. Also, by the way, we probably need like to replace this with uh, get char. So let's just define an interface for uh, for how does get char say I'm out of input. So since our default implementation of get char is read one and read one just returns an empty string. Let's work with that. If char is an empty string, break. Otherwise, we can do this. We don't need input index anymore because nobody's using it. We duplicated it here. And uh, here we just need to have like, if get.i is more equal to length of input, return an empty string. And this works, everything works. So now all we're left to do is uh, the magic Python incantation of if name is main return sys.exit brainfuck of co of, uh, okay, let's, uh, let's do a main here. Let's write a main. Basically what this does is brainfuck of code. But before that we need to like uh, assert that we have enough input. So uh, length of this should be two. One for the uh, name of the Python program and the second for our parameter which is code. So let's parse it. And here we can maybe have a usage message. Um, usage bf.py code and now we run our code and everything should work so return outside function that's correct just sysexit oh and if we finish might as well return zero awesome and now let's give it some code so uh one two three four five six seven eight one two three four five six seven eight minus plus dot, whoa, that was surprising. Maybe I, ah, too small. Um, one, two, three, four. I know exactly what's wrong, yeah, right. So it uh, prints A. You can see, the, I'm sorry, again with the cut screen. So uh, yeah, you can see this A here. This is us succeeding, and now let's, Go to the slides and copy the, the most interesting test, which is this. Right, echo hello to all that stuff. And it hates us because I want to add some Python here. Hello, woo! <laughs> and that's it, our talk is done.